we are live, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much. I want to say good morning to each and every one of you. Welcome to the Homeless and Poverty Committee uh, for Thursday. It is June 9th, uh, 2022. I am Council Member Kevin DeLeon. I am the Chair of this uh, committee. I'm going to turn it over to the city clerk, uh, Luigi, if you could be so kind enough to please uh, let's establish a clock. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Thank Member you. Thank you. Council Member Ross. Here. Council Member Buscaino. Good morning, here. Council Member Rodriguez. Council Member Rodriguez is absent. Council Member Blumenfield. Blumenfield present. Four members and a quorum, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Luigi. Good morning to each and every one of you, to our committee members, uh, Ms. Fromman, Mr. Chaney, and Mr. Bloomingfield. Uh, welcome. I want to welcome, again, my colleagues. Uh, before we take public comments, uh, I want to go over what our plans are for all the items that are before us today on our agenda. We'll be having presentations on file items number one uh, as well, two and three uh, this morning. I'm going to be making recommendations for the consent file, for files item number four through nine. Um, as we move forward on uh, file item number four, I'm going to recommend that we note and file the LA Housing uh, Department report, adopt the CEO's report on file item number five. I'm going to recommend that we note and file both the LA Housing Department's uh, report dated April 27, 2022, and the CA, uh, CIO report dated May 20th, 2022, and adopt the CEO's uh, report dated back to June 3rd of for the file items uh, six through nine, I'm going to adopt the recommendations uh, in the motion from the budget committee. Uh, that being said, uh, again, what we have up for vote today is um, uh, files one through three. We'll have presentations, obviously, if you can send file for a vote on four through nine. So that being said, let's hold up for public comments. Uh, Gita, we have Gita from the city attorney's office. If you could please provide us the, the public guidance so we may proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. To the members of the public calling in, when it's your turn to speak, please state your name and which of the agenda items you would like to speak on. You will have one minute to speak on one agenda item or two minutes to speak on two or more items. In addition, those of you who would like to address the committee with general public comment will be provided one additional minute for a maximum of up to three minutes per person for all agenda items, including general public comment. We will inform you when your time is up. When speaking on the agenda items, you must be on topic. Our goal is to get through as many speakers as we can. If you're not speaking on topic, or if we cannot tell whether you are speaking on an agenda item, you will get one brief warning from the chair. If you do not immediately get clearly back on topic, or if you again stray off topic, you will forfeit the rest of your time, and we will move on to the next speaker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Gita. Uh, Luigi, please. Uh, prepare folks for comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 160-453-9676 and then press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. When it is your turn to speak, an automated Zoom voice will ask you to press star six to unmute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luigi. I think we're ready. Uh, with Sarah Flaherty, uh, caller, please call in, say your name, the item that you'd like to speak on, uh, and uh, let's move forward. So Sarah, are we ready? Yes, we have James Miros from the Venice Neighborhood Council who has submitted a community impact statement Okay, go ahead, uh, Sarah, to, just to make sure we clarify, so we will have three minutes. Yeah. Three minutes, okay, move forward. Thank you very much. Welcome, James. Hi, thank you. Um, thank you all for participating in this meeting today. Uh, I'm actually uh, commenting on item number five. We did submit a community impact statement on this project several years ago. The Venice Neighborhood Council um, uh, voted uh, very clearly to not support the project as it was presented at the time because there were many issues that deeply concerned uh, the vast majority of the community. Um, in, 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 in summary, the project is out of scale with the community. It's, it's located in the middle of a residential neighborhood. This will be the largest project 
uh, that's even been proposed in the last hundred years in Venice uh, since the original development of Abbot Kenny um, having created uh, the city of, of Venice at the time. Um, the project is, is uh, spread out over, uh, I believe, 44 parcels of land. Um, and the proposed project is, is uh, being described to tie 44 parcels of land together, which is a violation of the Coastal Act for this part of the coastal region. Uh, the maximum lot tie on a commercial project is three lots. So, so this is a big concern, but it, it goes back to and addresses the scale of the project. It's way out of scale. Um, the cost of the project far exceeds that of any other affordable housing project that has been proposed to date, um, which discounts the land value, which is estimated to be somewhere between 60 and $100 million because it's one block from the beach. Um, but it, it, uh, it also takes this, this 60 to $100 million piece of land, says it's zero, but just the construction cost is near $1.2 million at current prices per door for a 400 square foot uh, flat. Um, and in the documentation that was posted on this project uh, on your agenda for today, there is a report that talks about temporary parking. Um, the Venice Farmers Market, which has been in existence since 1989, exists in uh, LA DOT Lot 701 under a Coastal Development Act that allowed the, con the construction of that parking lot uh, back in the early 90s. They're planning on using that parking lot for construction parking and for temporary parking during the development of the project, so says the application that they filed. That will shut the farmer's market down um, if that's allowed to exist. And, and that's a very big concern to over 1,000 people a week that attend that market. Um, on that, I will end my, my official VNC comments, but at this point, we haven't seen the project for, for many, many years. It's changed many times over. Um, at the very least, the project should be postponed until the Neighborhood Council can weigh in on the current revision of the project and, and uh, then be able to uh, at least voice a, a, a more current view. But to my understanding, the project has only gone farther in the wrong direction. Uh, on a personal note, I want to thank uh, uh, both the chair of this, uh, Mr. DeLeon, and Mr. Bischiano for both uh, running for mayor. Um, as somebody who uh, ran for council district in, in CD11 myself this time around, I now realize what a tremendous effort it is on your parts, and I want to thank you guys both very much for all you do for the city and, and all you have done, and, and I'll end at that. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, we'll take your comments into consideration. Thank you very much for the comments, and have a lovely day. Uh, Sarah, let's move on with the next callers, please. Yes, with the caller with the number ending in 2979, uh, please press star 6 to unmute. State your name and the items on which you'd like to speak, please. My name is Peggy Lee Kennedy, and I'm from Venice, third generation resident. I'd like to speak on general public comment, agenda item 5 and agenda item 9. Thank you. Caller, you have three minutes. Um, I'd just like to start with agenda item five for uh, the housing project there. Uh, I strongly support it, and I wouldn't listen to somebody that hires thugs to get rid of houseless people from his, his preferred neighborhood. Uh, that's ridiculous. It's been vetted. People, I mean, it's gone in front of the community many times. The fact is, is that Venice has suffered under... Uh, demolished low-income housing for years, 20-plus years, so that luxury development can be put in. This is such a drop in the bucket of reparations to what's happened to our community that it should be supported every single step of the way. And uh, agenda item 9, uh, you know, I, in Venice we have these after-hour sanitation events on the beach already. They're uh, quite uh, amazing. They get away with whatever in the dark. They have been caught. The sanitation people have been caught playing handball while the police stand around supposedly protecting them after they remove unhoused people. I mean, this is outrageous to even suggest that this happens in the dark. Um, and for my general public comment, 
I want to say that, uh, you know, as a, as a person that on my own, as a volunteer who provides services to people, I happen to know that it's really important, especially in the summer, during the hotter time, that unhoused people have access to shade and sanitary facilities. And this includes being in parks and near libraries. If we don't have the proper solutions to offer these people, we should not be just coming up and sweeping them. It harms people. You know, all this fear-mongering is really inappropriate. There are people that are disabled. They're seniors. And they have major mental health issues. These people need our help. They should not be just swept from one spot to another because people are complaining. Uh, it's a really sad state of affairs that we can't come up with permanent, supportive housing as a primary objective to solve homelessness in the city of L.A. And you guys are all responsible for that. I think you should consider it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peggy, for your comments. Peggy Lee. Uh, let's go on to our next one. The caller with the number ending in 2343. Please press star six to unmute. Good morning, it's Robin Rudisco, agenda item five and general public comment. Thank you, caller. You have two minutes. So this request for authorization to execute a disposition and development agreement is premature, legally, morally, and ethically. You must not commit the city before the project is approved. It's the cart before the horse. Doing so would be negligent and a dereliction of duty, also known as the shameful failure to fulfill your obligations to the public. One main problem is that not only has the state not yet approved the coastal development permit for this project, which is required in the dual coastal zone, but the city coastal development permit is not yet effective until it's run through its Coastal Commission appeal period. The city CDP is also not yet effective as the Coastal Commission hasn't certified the land use plan amendment. So neither the city entitlements nor the state and other required approvals are in place. Your city attorney knows this, so please, council members, ask the city attorney why they are okay with you approving this DDA. The DDA would commit the public's land. The fine print says irrevocable. I'm 100% certain that not one of you could defend all of the significant violations of this project or say why it should be approved and why, in light of your code of ethics, this extreme waste of public funds should go forward. I fight every day for affordable housing in this city, but I cannot condone a project that violates the Coastal Act in more ways than I've ever seen for any one project. Your duty to us, the citizens of Los Angeles, requires that you not mismanage and waste public funds. Please do the right thing and delay this decision until all of the approvals are in place. Hopefully that will never happen. Thank you very much, caller. Let's go on to the next one. Caller with the number ending in 3322. Would you please press star 6 to unmute? Hi. Hi. Um, I am, my name is Gary Pearl. I am a, um, got 30 year Venice, uh, Venice resident, third generation Angelican, and I want to speak to items five and then general, then general, uh, comments. Okay, you have um, two minutes. Thank you. I've lived through all of this from start to end. To hear someone say that, you know, whatever, you know, that, that, that this, that this whole community is, has gotten rid of homeless housing. That's not true. Venice has always taken care of the homeless. What we've been is impacted by, by a campaign to bring the homeless to Venice. And now we're being impacted by the city council giving away for a, for a dollar a year 40 parcels that are worth between 60 and $100 million in, a, in an area that is, that is way out of, it's way out of scale. And also it's intended to be the flood zone. So they, they clearly say, oh, well, then the, then the flood will just be everywhere else. You are literally building on a property that will put homeless people, unhoused people, underprivileged people in what, what, what's the equivalent of, of New Orleans, you know, Section 9 or Houston. When there, when there is a 100-year storm, they will be the ones impacted. You're taking away the access to the people's beach. It's been there for over 100 years that was, that was built on by Abbott Kinney with the perp 
purpose of being the accessible part for everyone that lives that lives east of the 405. To hear anyone saying we're not taking care of the homeless is, is actually wrong. This city council is literally letting people die and forcing people to die and bringing people in to die. And I, I'd like to see that stop. And just giving this away without any approvals and forcing this through today with a councilman who's admitted to things like mental health issues, who really should, who really should check everything that's been done under his watch. I think this is this is just a travesty of duty. Thank you very much. I'm done speaking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Colin, let's go on to next uh, uh, speaker, please. Call with the number ending in 4220. Please press star 6 to unmute. Again, call ending with the number ending in 4220. All right, we'll come back to you. Um, caller with the number ending in 0130, please press star six to unmute. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please see your name and items on which you like to speak, caller. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Mia Grindon. I am a resident of Pacific Palisades, lifelong West Side resident. Um, I'd like to comment on um, number five, agenda number five and nine. I, I mean, this is just it is okay, so important. Two minutes, we, then caller. Okay, it is so important that we um, push through stem cell housing development. It is necessary we are in a true affordable housing crisis and people who say that they want solutions um to be unhoused and they want to get them off of the streets they want to clear public spaces so that quote unquote everyone can enjoy them well that's only possible unless we start implementing solutions yes they are expensive we have the funding, the funding is sitting still, and the people who resist it by citing things like the California Coastal Act are just honestly using excuses. There is room for farmers markets across the city. There is room for people to enjoy the beaches and access the beaches. There is, I mean, all of California, like we are, we're all here on the west side in a coastal zone and we're all enjoying it and it's some of the most privileged people ever. And if we can deal with it and if we can deal with the threat, then you know what? I think there is a path forward for affordable housing. Um, we need to build housing where the unhoused are. People deserve to be in their communities. The evidence shows that if they are housed in other parts of the city, quote unquote, you know, safer, less contentious zones, that is not the long term path to rehabilitation and to reintegration into their native communities. And on agenda item nine, I would just like to strongly oppose the um, nighttime sanitation sweeps. This is a misuse of funds, we need to be using it on housing people, not moving people around, not compromising their safety. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending in 4220, please press star six to unmute. Hello, my name is Linda Lux. I moved to Venice in 1970. Um, I served on the Venice Neighborhood Council and I'm um, speaking on item number five. Okay, you have a minute, Holly. Yes, my strongly support Venice Community Housing and Hollywood Community Housing's um, uh, project, de uh, development project that will provide 140 units of long term housing for people, artists, low wage earners, and formerly homeless people. The vast majority of Venice people do support this creating this development. It's been in process for seven years. It's gone through multiple, multiple hearings in people's homes, in public hearings. It's time to move forward on this project and get people off the street and into homes. 
I know you'll do the right thing. It's already been approved by the full council, so let's do this. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending in 0816, please press star 6 to unmute. Again, caller, oh, good job. Okay, please state your name and the item on which you'd like to speak. Hi, my name is Allie Mills Bean, and I'd like to make um, public comment and also speak on item number five. Great, you have two minutes. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Allie Mills Bean. Um, my late husband, Orson Bean, and I are long-term residents of Venice and have been very active in this community. I'm, I'm really happy to be talking to this particular committee today. I, I would love you guys to come to Venice and get to know what's happening here. Um, we've been trying to reach out to the mayor's office. Uh, this um, Linda Lux, who just spoke about it, who's a good friend of mine, and I'm a longtime supporter, supporter of Venice Community Housing, works for Venice Community Housing, and the projects that they've done before are perfect scale, they're small, and they integrate into our neighborhoods and communities and have been very successful. This is massively overscaled. They've never handled anything like it, and I'm sorry, Linda, but the outreach in this project has been really terrible. Our community is a very compassionate community. It's gotten a bad rap. Um, I, I've never met such a wonderful group of people. We are from very socioeconomically diverse backgrounds and have always been supportive of our homeless neighbors. But this project is totally, not only out of scale, but it's a block from the biggest open air drug market in California other than the Tenderloin and Skid Row. My beloved granddaughter OD'd on fentanyl. It's outrageous that you can get fentanyl 24 hours a day, right a block away from this project. It's not compassionate to the people that will be housed there. It's not a sober facility. We don't understand what the services are going to be. I've been begging for information. The outreach has just been terrible. And, and for them to go to, the, to you as a committee to try to push this through just seems, again, like so untransparent. This has not been... A transparent process and the, our neighbors are wonderful and we want to dialogue with you we would love it please the outreach has not been great I've been at these meetings at the, at the people's homes and they just say we have to agree to thank you caller caller with the number ending in 1303 please press star 6 to unmute Caller, please state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak. Hi, my name is Helen Fallon. I'm a longtime Venice resident. I'd like to speak on item five. Okay, you have um, one minute. Okay, this mixed use project is the poster child for backroom deals made with special interest. In the first place, these parcels and this parking lot were never underutilized. It's the beach parking for the entire city of Los Angeles. These, uh, the project negatively impacts beach access for all Los Angelinos. Those are your constituents. The public parking remains undefined as, as of this date. We don't even know what this entire project is going to look like. It's premature to approve this. Uh, please don't approve something when you don't even know what the entire project looks like. Thank you. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending in 0950. Please press star six to unmute. Please state your name and the item on which you'd like to speak. Yes, hi, good morning. My name is Lisa Redmond and I would like to speak on item five, item nine and general public comment. Okay, you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, in give my support. I am a longtime Venice resident. I've been here for uh, 30 years plus. Uh, I am in support of this project, um, Venice Bell Project. Um, we feel very much like it's needed here. I'm very happy to see that this lot is utilized for something effective that we desperately need in the city. Um, 
Uh, you know, I know that Mr. Boscaito was a big supporter of the Alliance lawsuit that says we need to create more housing for homeless people. Um, Mr. De Leon, you have your 25,000 unit plan by 2025. Again, we have to start somewhere. This is not only going to uh, use a parking lot that's been underutilized, but still remain and provide even further parking with additional parking units for uh, beachgoers. People say that we're taking away the last open space in Venice. In Venice, we are blessed with a three-mile swath of open space called the beach, just a block away from this. People can use that uh, for open space. We really need this housing here. I think it's a wonderful idea to take advantage of this space and to use it for something that's so desperately needed, not only in this community, but in this city. Um, in speaking in item nine, you know, this has been said over and over and over again. Sweeps are terrible, terrible idea to begin with. Um, it doesn't solve homelessness. It only moves it down the road. It's playing whack-a-mole. It's kicking the can. And it takes people away from services, from service providers who are making connections. Um, and then to even do it at night unnecessarily while people are sleeping is especially cool. Can you imagine, you know, being woken up in the middle of the night for services and people telling you you have to leave immediately, gather your stuff while you're half asleep, um, that just doesn't work. Um, this is funding that can be desperately used to have even more service providers, to have more lots of people, to have more St. Joseph people on the street connecting people to services, not waking people up in the middle of the night and removing them from uh, their service providers. That's all I have to say. Uh, thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending in 6443. Please press star 6 to unmute. Please your name uh, and the items on which you'd like to speak. Thanks. Thank you. I'm, my name is David. I want to speak on five men in general, please. Okay, that's three minutes. Go ahead. All right, um, for the, the chair of this committee, not even getting 10% of the mayor vote is, is not only a, a vote of no confidence, but a wake-up call for you that what you're doing is not what is needed to solve the housing crisis. It's not a homelessness crisis. It's, a, it's, a house, it's, a, it's an actually affordable housing crisis. And that's not building apartments and hoping that the market solves it. Actually developing projects like the Venice Dow Housing development in CD11, where the projects like this one are placed in the middle of residential areas, like the earlier call, call worried about the, the farmer's market, is immaterial. If it affects the farmer's market or anyone else's sense of convenience, we have to ask, when are we going to take seriously the needs of the most vulnerable people in this town? If callers are worried about mismanaging public funds, be item nine. That calls for more encampment sweeps to happen instead of providing permanent housing solutions. We know that between sometimes over a dozen cops, sometimes over a dozen sanitation workers, and all the gadgets they bring out from tractors to trash trucks to police SUVs, running with the air conditioner on for hours while these sweeps take to finish. That, that's where the money is getting dumped. And why are we planning encampment sweeps at, at times later in the day than the morning? On agenda item nine. You want to have these done under the dark so nobody sees them? Well, we know there's a paltry amount of housing, the scare quotes around housing available. Every site you have for Project Green Key, it's all set to close down this summer. Some of the biggest ones, the Grand, where De Leon ordered sweeps, nighttime sweeps, to, to make it look like homelessness didn't exist in this town so the Summer of the Americas could happen over the weekend. We saw that. And they went on past the times that were on the sweep notices that were put up on the polls. That's naughty, Dion. We caught you. And how are you going to be able to control these teams finishing on time? How many units do you actually have open? They're not even in the dozens in each of these PRK sites. All the decompression from COVID, it's coming back. We're all getting COVID again. Everyone in Canton can get it too. And you want to have sweeps day and night? 
any sites can't take on all the people that you're trying to sweep around and shuffle around town. Just last week on the lead up to the Summit of Americas, they were attempted to disappear everyone living along the 110 freeway, so Biden could cruise in and say, wow, what a good job. We saw people getting their tents and everything inside of them, including medications, clothes, blankets, forms of identification, and all kinds of other valuables get thrown out right across the street from the Grand Hotel where they're being told there aren't enough rooms for them to be housed instead of sitting out there in their tent. And people hammering in about harm reduction, I'm sorry, people are overdosing of fentanyl. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending in 1115, please press star six to unmute. Thank you. Yes, hi, Sean O'Brien. I'd like to speak on 5 9 in general comment, please. Okay, you have three minutes, Sean. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I wish to uh, talk about uh, 9 first. Uh, we need uh, as much help as we can. Most of the homeless people in my neighborhood, they're not sleeping at night, they're out raging and partying. So when people complain that we're going to be disturbing them in their sleep, these are not those people that we're talking about. Uh, on general comment, I uh, want to talk briefly on democracy, that you are representing the will of the people, not the special interests, not the developers or the politicians that represent them. Democ democracy represents us all through our voices of support and discontent. If we had true democracy, this project would have been void from inception. It has already denied by, been denied by the DNC and most of them is due to its size, location, and cost. As, uh, part, as far as item number five, uh, nobody's talking about the parking. There's 61 residential parking spaces for 420 people plus their guests. Where are they going to park? They're going to park on the streets. Uh, the parking for the tourists is mechanical lift parking that hasn't even been finished with, it hasn't even been completed with the design and it hasn't been presented to the neighbors. Uh, how can you get a secret exemption for a mechanical lift um, city-owned parking structure. It's insane. Uh, loss of, you know, fiscal impact. Loss of revenue from the city. This week alone, you know, we got a uh, huge production company renting out both parking lots for staging. The city's going to lose millions of dollars a year not being able to rent out uh, uh, for, 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 for to enable production in the city of Venice. Uh, open space. You can't have the beaches open space. It's only acceptable from 180 degrees, only one side. You can't go on the other side of the water and look towards them. Otherwise, if we have all open space, all we've got to do is directly, look directly above our head. Uh, this project goes against the city mobility plan. It, it has substandard sidewalks surrounding it. It has substandard uh, roads, bus lanes, bike lanes. Um, the... Um, Parking restrictions, uh, sorry, the mechanical parking, it's in a residential neighborhood. And when the tourists come to visit the beach, how long is it going to take them to park? they got to remove bikes, coolers, umbrellas, their children. You name it, they're boogie boards, surfboards, blankets, towels. And they're going to do all this while waiting for a mechanical lift. And meanwhile... If the other people are waiting to park with the same toys to bring to the beach, uh, please... Please, if you if you can't do it, just just abstain. This this, as it's been stated previously, uh, this, you're putting the cart before the horse. This project hasn't gone through the proper um, um, uh, application. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending in seven zero two two. Please press star six to unmute. Hi, caller. Please state your name and the item on which you'd like to speak. Seven zero two two. Please state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak. One more time. Caller 
start with the number ending in 7022. Please state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak. Yes, I'd like to speak on agenda item 5 in public comment. Okay, you have two minutes. Hi, my name is Eddie H, and I'm a member of LA County Civil and Human Rights Committee. And we are here today to strongly oppose any and all nighttime sweeps. We see this as it is, another political tactic to further target, harass, and remove selective encampments from public areas. Businesses, the bids, or memories don't want them. An example of this sweeps, uh, you know, KDL. You know, you did a, a good example of this, what you did on Main Street, uh, El Pablo, and Little Tokyo. It was all for the business interest, and we say hell no to this. On the other hand, we highly support the VCA housing project, and you should too, because VCA is doing their part to not only preserve what little affordable housing that's left, but they are actually building as well. Something this committee needs to copy and paste. Because us real Angelinos, we ain't forgot about our billion dollars that we gave you, but we gave this committee only to have 40% go to your business buddies at Saw College, while five homeless people are dying a day on the streets. Stop the streets, we say, and house keys now what? And cut. Thank you, caller. Caller with the number ending in 4199. Please press star six to unmute. Caller, please state your name and the items on which you'd like to speak. Roddy Williams, items number nine and public comment, please. Oh, and five, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, you have three minutes, ma'am. Go ahead. I'd like to say uh, we need to really look at what BCH is trying to do. We're trying to get people off the street. If you support the project, then you get uh, units that people can afford. People can move near the beach. People can have somewhere to be housed. I'm on Third Street right now, uh, and they're doing the uh, spot cleaning. I was on Hampton earlier. They were doing the comprehensive cleaning. That in itself is enough if we have to have it. But nighttime sweeps, I don't agree with. Anything done in the night is not right. It needs to be done in the daytime if it's going to be done. And if we're really looking for solutions, there's properties that are for sale. The city could invest in those properties and give people places to live, places to be. These are human beings we're talking about. We're not talking about people that don't exist. I grew up with a tremendous amount of the people that we're speaking about, and they had low-income housing in the Cadillac, in the uh, Rose 5, and it was all taken. And what some of it's being used for now is Airbnb, which is another thing that has caused people to be put out of their low-income housing so they could make money off of Airbnb. There's many solutions to what we're going through in Venice, and one of them is let's do the hard work. Let's buy properties, let's build properties, thank you, VCH, and let's get people off the street. That's all they're asking. And they're my brethren, and I'm here to speak for them, and I'm here almost every day working with them. I love them, and they need the same respect that we all want and that is to love one another. Thank you very much. Thank you, caller. That concludes public comment for today. Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Sarah. I want to thank uh, all our callers who uh, called in today. Uh, committee members, as I mentioned earlier, are making the following recommendations on consent. Uh, again, file item number one. I'm going to recommend that we note and file uh, the Housing Department report, adopt the CEO's report, file item number five. I recommend uh, that we note uh, and file both the LA Housing Department report dated back uh, April uh, 27, 2022, uh, and the CAO report dated May 30th, 2022, and also adopt the CAO report dated June 3rd, 2022. File items number six through nine, adopt the recommendations in the motion from the budget committee. Do you have any questions or comments uh, from the members? Mr. Muscano. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to hold item five. Hold item number five. 
Uh, is there a whole item for an improper discussion, uh, Mr. Buscano? Um, and for comments and a vote. Okay, so what we'll do is we will remove number five from the uh, consent file to have that discussion. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Any other co questions or comments uh, from my colleagues? Just, sorry, uh, if Go I ahead. could just, I, I just wanted to hear again which ones we're moving forward on consent. I apologize. We are moving forward. We are going to move forward out item number five. We're going to pull that uh, for discussion uh, and an individual vote. Uh, we're going to move forward um, five, um, number four. And six through nine. Six through nine are the adoptions of recommendations in the motion from the budget committee. Thank you. Okay, very well. Okay, so no more other questions. Uh, Luigi, if you could be so uh, please call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member DeLeon. Aye. Council Member Raman. Yes. Council Member Buscaino. Aye. Council Member Rodriguez. Council Member Rodriguez is absent. Council Member Blumenfield. Luigi, aye. Four ayes, and these items are approved. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Luigi, we passed our files item number four, uh, as well as six through nine. Uh, we will uh, number uh, five for discussion, but we're going to move forward uh, with the agenda right now. I just want to uh, quickly uh, note that what we did right now is we provided supplemental funding uh, to complete uh let's see 420 units of affordable and permanent housing supportive housing in council district number one uh represented by councilman gil Cedillo. that is 122 units council district number uh 10 uh represented by council member herb wesson 72 units and then my district council district number 14 226 units uh we also approved the policy motions that came from this year's budget uh, conversation asking for the CAO and the LASA uh, to report on council possibility of bringing outreach in-house to the city. Additionally, LASA report to the council on metrics related to domestic uh, violence survivors and also LASA report to the council uh, specifically uh, with a breakdown of the growth uh, of their staff specifically. And finally, LA sanitation to the council on the addition of a second shift of four other teams. And let me be very clear. These are not cleanups during the nighttime. This is a second shift because it usually stops at 1230 midday today. So just to clarify for uh, many of the callers who may uh, have been uh, mistaken or uh, unfortunately perhaps misled, these are not night shifts. You know, these are specifically a second shift and that is post 1230 p.m. midday. We could usually be finalized uh, at uh, midday. So I'm going to move forward on our three remaining agenda items. Uh, then we'll go back to file number five. Uh, Luigi, if you could be so kind of to read the first one into the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item number one is a city administrative officer report relative to the Homeless Housing Assistance and Prevention Grant Program Round 2 funding recommendations. Very much, uh, Luigi. Thank you. Um, I think we have uh, Mindy uh, in the office for a brief presentation on this item. Uh, Mindy, you can please, uh, the virtual microphone uh, is all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, committee members. I'm Mindy Patosman with the Office of the CAO. And before you today is the Homeless Housing Assistance Prevention Grant Program Round 2 Funding Report, or HAP 2 for short which is a grant from the state of California to assist local jurisdictions to develop and expand capacity of services to reduce homelessness across California. The city was awarded $55,575,000 in HAP2 funds, which council and mayor approved to be used across five funding categories. Funding category one is the COVID-19 homelessness roadmap operating costs. Funding gap category two is a bridge home operating costs. Funding category three is street strategy, outreach, public health, and hygiene for citywide at Skidville. Funding category four is set aside for youth. And funding category five is administrative costs. Our office prioritized using HAP2 funding to continue ongoing programs within the city for the next fiscal year. As such, I'll briefly go over our funding recommendations for each category. 
First, our office recommends renaming funding category one to COVID-19 homelessness roadmap operating and capital costs to better accommodate projects within the COVID-19 homelessness roadmap pipeline. Within funding category two, a bridge home operating cost, we recommend $6.1 million to continue funding for six abridged home sites. Additionally, we recommend reprogramming about $16.4 million from funding category one and two to funding category three to increase appropriations for the services. The funding category three, which is street strategy, outreach, public health, and hiking, the report recommends funding for the next fiscal year for various programs, $10.2 million for citywide and Skid Row mobile pit stop program and city uh, Skid Row litter abatement program which is administered by the Board of Public Works. It's $1.4 million for salaries associated for the Office of the CAO's Outreach Staff. $889,240 to the General Services Department for the Portable Hygiene Stations. $773,727 to the Bureau of Sanitation for the Shark Fox Collection Program and the YMCA Shower Program. And $11.2 million to LASA for various services such as outreach, hygiene, uh, prevention, and supportive services. In funding category four, for set aside youth, our office recommends programming $1.2 million for one youth abridge home site located in Council District 11. And lastly, in funding category five, $3.4 million is recommended for salaries for various staff in the city to support the city's homelessness efforts and programs. Attachment one in the report also pro um, provides a breakdown for all the various um, programs that are funded and the amounts, and also includes um, HAP2 funds that were programmed in our 11th homelessness roadmap report. This concludes my presentation, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Mindy, um, for the presentation. I appreciate that you have broken down the, the spending in categories. Uh, uh, includes shows of programs and, and housing funded by um, the HAP, um, uh, most notably those in category funding, uh, category two, the uh, abridged home operating costs. Um, we will have to have a, a need, I should say, for a larger commitment, clearly, to the category uh, funding, um, category one to be very specific, and the homeless roadmap operating uh, uh, and, and capital. As, as we continue to bring on new um, housing units uh, online. Uh, let me say one thing, and I'm just gonna ask for uh, 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 an answer to the question. Um, the one that stands out for me the most is, is the category three, uh, which is the street strategy, the outreach, the public health, and the hygiene, both citywide, and specifically uh, Skid Row, uh, which is, uh, uh, has us committed $24 million to various activities or various services, I should say, and nearly half of that uh, of it uh, is for the ground zero homelessness uh, in the city of LA, uh, Skid Row. The other half uh, mostly committed to citywide programs with a few small ones in different council districts. Uh, as we construct, construct more homeless housing or, or capital expenses and the annual uh, operating costs are, are going to continue to, 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 to grow. They're going to rise, I mean, we're going to have to be very, 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 very judicious, you know, uh, with the funding that we have today. So for, for those listening um, in today, uh, audio, so I don't think we're video. Um, uh, Luigi, are we video or it's just, it's just pure audio? Uh, pure audio, Mr. Chair. Right, okay, for those who are listening, can we, can we quickly, can you quickly I should say, explain how these programs have become part of the HAP uh, expenditures, uh, and no need to go through each one. I don't want to go through each one, uh, but just give a, a really broad macro overview on, on what uh, or why uh, these are funded by HAP and not through the city's regular annual budget process. So two separate things, the HAP and then obviously the city's regular annual budget process. So if you could uh, give the, the audio uh, listener today from the public uh, a, a quick explanation. I would appreciate that. Yes, of course. So, as you know, general fund is our most like flexible dollars that we receive that we manage for homelessness. Uh, so, we prioritize using HAP for these programs because um, the programs that are listed as, um, in this report they are they fit what the grant is meant to do, which is to do um, provide 
homeless services and expand our capacity so it falls with, under the eligible use for this. And uh, we'd like to use general fund um, to use for like any potentially HAP ineligible programs or programs that require one-time funding or additional funding. So um, by having a HAP, it really um, gives that flexibility for general fund to be used for other things. Um, and when it comes to kind of like when it comes to programs um, and when we consider what funding sources to use, uh, two main ideas that come um, that kind of drive our strategy is what are the eligible uses of these grant funds. Um, as I mentioned, the grant funds are intended to help develop and expand cities' capacity for homelessness programs. And so, even though certainly these programs are eligible to be funded through a uh, general fund as well, but we want to make sure that um, whatever programs that are, um, that would meet the HAPS goals on performing, uh, like what it's meant to be used for, we like to allocate funding using HAP. Um, another reason we use HAP to, as well is because we, um, from the city's interest, we have um, special funds and special grants such as HAP. And um, when it comes to that, we want to ensure that we're spending every single dollar, dollar, every single cent, and we're not sending any money back to the state. Um, and we're also prioritizing those funds. To, like, and because they have expenditure deadlines, we also want to prioritize using these funds as well because you know, we have to sometimes commit these funds by a specific date. And then, or like we have expenditure deadlines that we have to meet. So we don't want to send any funding back to the state. Um, Additionally, with like HAP 2 and what you'll hear later with HAP 3 is that we receive potential, our potential allocations from the state uh, well in advance, which allows us to kind of plan ahead for future program funding um, for at least another year to two years. Whereas when it comes to the general fund process, uh, we don't know where, uh, it's during the budget process that we're understanding where we're at and then once the budget is adopted, that's when we can plan. So um, that's why with HAP, um, we want to make sure we're, we are prioritizing ongoing services. And since we know what we're going to uh, receive in the state, we're able to plan that well in advance. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Indy. I think it's clear that we're funding uh, a lot of great programs, and we need to keep uh, doing so. But, but given the new fiscal year uh, coming up, uh, you know, shortly, right, and, and in about three weeks, a little more than three weeks, I think it, it would be prudent to look at the metrics that we use for, for each program and ensure that we have a consistent reporting across all programs uh, that we're getting the best bang for a dollar. I think we have to be very judicious uh, given the dollars we have. That being said, what I like to do is I like to modify uh, the report to provide six months of funding for the program instead of a four year. But let me be very clear with everyone uh, who's listening today. I want to, we're going to make sure that the remaining six months will be set aside and not, not going to be used for any other purposes. It's all be in the lockbox. We're not going to lose that money at all whatsoever. For the whole year of funding of that six months, the latter part of the year, it will still be there and will not be utilized for anything else. What I want is, uh, I want to get back a report uh, uh, with, a, with you, Mindy, and the CAO's office in coordination with LASA on the efficacy of each of the programs that we are funding. It's really critical for us uh, as the committee members of this committee, homelessness and poverty, make sure we utilize the dollars as, as wisely as possible, as judicially as possible too. So to ensure that uh, we're fiscally responsible, we're getting the most pain for the buck so we can provide most services uh, for our housing. I would like to make the following recommendations. And I'm gonna go through it right now. Um, I am, uh, let me see, what am I? That's right. I don't know if you guys can hear that noise. There's some construction going on outside. But um, I move that the matter of uh, the city administration, administrative office office report relative to the homeless um, housing assistance and prevention grant program round two funding recommendation dated May 19, 2022, in parentheses uh, CF 20-1524 be amended to strike recommendation number 12. Uh, amend recommendations for six, seven, eight, nine, and 13. Uh, a through C and L through M to include only six months funding for the continuation of services from July 1st, 2022, uh, that being the new fiscal year to December 31st, uh, 2022, half of the fiscal year, uh, end of the calendar year. Now the following recommendation, uh, number 15, instruct the general manager of uh, LA 
Housing Department or their designee to amend the city's homelessness housing assistance and prevention program contract with LASA. C-135650 to have allocations shown in recommendation 2, 7, and 10. Secondly, I move that the City Administrative Officer, LA Housing Department, and Chief Legislative Analyst, with assistance from the LA Housing Service Authority, develop a set of informed metrics, and this is the key part, a set of informed metrics for all of the HAP2 funded outreach, hygiene, and street services programs recommended for six months funding and provide a report back in 60 days, and that's two months, with recommendations on measuring these programs' effectiveness, standardizing reporting metrics across multiple programs, establishing standard fee rates for services provided, standardizing invoicing, and reporting deadlines and whether or not any program should have changes in their contract scope or duration. So I want to underscore once again, um, that money in the last six months will not be utilized for anything else, but this program, the continuation of this program, uh, what we want to get back is some really clear metrics and recommendations having the CLA, LASA, as well as SAIL working in coordination and collaboration with each other to come back in two months with the report to each and every one of you committee members that are before us. Uh, do we have any questions or commentaries from my colleagues? Seeing none, oh, uh, Miss, yeah, Miss Watt, go ahead. I'm just uh, struggling to follow a little bit what exactly we're changing in this. Um, uh, you, you, the, you were talking about um, bucket three. So is this recommendation just to impact that third bucket of, of programs related to council district based F, you know, FC3 street strategy outreach and public health and hygiene programs, that list that we have for council district specific programs on page four of the CAO report? The answer is yes. Okay. To you answer, the answer is yes. Okay. And that's, instead of that funding that for a year, you're saying just fund that for six months and then provide a report back on measuring their effectiveness? Yeah, and that report back would be within two months. Okay. Okay, and that money, the, the, the six months money for the latter part of the next fiscal year, it stays in the lockbox. It doesn't go anywhere else. It's going to stay there so we can uh, collectively uh, move forward on its approval. So then you may, when the report comes back, we may want to make some recommendations, some edits, but that'll be collectively up to us uh, when it comes back on this from it. Okay, that's great. And so you and you, so your vision for this is that we would hopefully hear this as soon as we come back from recess. Oh yeah, within two months. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thank you much. Seeing no other uh, questions, uh, welcome to some members. Uh, we have a. Uh, 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 motion uh, by Ms. Rahm and herself. Um, Luigi, please call the roll. Councilmember De Leon. Aye. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Buscaino. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez is absent. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Four ayes, and this item is approved as amended. Thank you very much, Luigi. That being said, I want to go back to file item number five that will be forced in the agenda. Mr. Buscaino had requested that we move it from the uh, consent file, I believe, for commentary. Uh, we, so we're going to go back to file item number five. Mr. Buscaino, the virtual microphone it is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Just want to be consistent with uh, my concerns and my vote on this. Is my son's call on me? Sorry about that. On item number five, again, a well-intended project. I had an opportunity to meet with a number of the residents there on the ground, including the families who are living on site and have deep concerns about uh, their displacement. It's, um, what we have before us is um, uh, a project where affordable housing advocates are even opposing. Um, deeply concerned about uh, a, a number of the issues here as raised by a few of the callers and in addition um, concerns about the 
lack of trust between local government and the residents there, particularly among the, the issues of, of a, a lack of support of enforcing the rules at homeless sites uh, in the Venice area. Um, we have seen a lack of a citywide ordinance that prohibits camping outside homeless housing. In addition, um, at, at concerns about uh, the automatic 1,000 foot buffer zone previously, um, that um, something that I've been calling for around the city. Um, so there have been broken promises there in Venice with the bridge home site currently. Um, and of course, legitimate fears that um, the, the permanent supportive housing project there will impact the quality of life. Um, also, we're coming off an election, uh, a primary election, where the majority of the candidates running for CD11 all oppose this project. So they are hearing firsthand uh, the deep concerns about this moving forward. And I'll be consistent with my no vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Buscano. Uh, made that, made, uh, uh, we know this for the record. Uh, we have noticed uh, your very, very, very short haircuts. Shortest ever seen I did before. <laughs> so that being said, uh, do we have any other, uh, Mr. Bloomingdale? I don't know if it's possible to have a uh, city attorney uh, address some of the concerns that were raised. There were a number of concerns about legality and um, sort of going with a sole source on this. And I just, I want to make sure that we're crossing our T's and dotting our I's so that uh, when the inevitable lawsuit comes that we will prevail and that, that our money will go to providing housing and not lawsuits. So if, if the city attorney could address some of the some of the legal questions that were raised, uh, that would be great. Sure, council member. It might be better if we raise them though, not in this public forum. So we're happy to brief um, your office on these issues um, as soon as possible. I just don't think we should discuss them in this open forum. A lot of it's legal advice. Okay. But I, I, I recognize that, but I guess just give us your assurance that, that we're on sound footing and then I will, I'll take that briefing offline. Um, the city attorney has reviewed all of the um, documents underlying this transaction and um, we will brief your office um, with more details. And if any other council member also wants a briefing, just let us know. Okay, thank you. Thank you much, Mr. Blanco. I, I, if I may um, uh, be bold enough to maybe um, interpret myself, uh, not on behalf of the uh, the city attorney's office, but I, b I believe there is uh, solid legal uh, grounds. I think you are right, Mr. Bloomfield. Uh, the inevitable will happen has always been the case uh, in the city of LA on any type of project, uh, especially when it comes to homeless housing or affordability housing. Not just large luxury market rates, um, but um, I uh, thank you very much, uh, um, uh, Madam City Attorney, uh, for providing uh, Mr. Uh, Bloomingfield that uh, brief sooner. For that matter, anyone else uh, on this committee? Is there no other questions or commentaries? Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Just yeah. for the record, for the, for the listening audience, um, the yeah. reason why we can't go into closed session on this item because it hasn't been posted to such. Is that my understanding? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that being said, uh, we have a motion by uh, Ms. Raman. Uh, Luigi, would you be enough to please call the roll? Council Member De Leon. Aye. Council Member Raman. Yes. Council Member Buscaino. No. Council Member Rodriguez. Council Member Rodriguez is absent. Council Member Blumenfield. Council Member Blumenfield. Come on, Bob. Come on, Bob. <laughs> Speak for the people. You're on mute. Probably better. I, I didn't. I didn't did, did we get a recorded uh, a vote from Mr. Bloomingdale? We did not. Council Member Bloomingdale. Oh. Sorry, I thought, I thought you could hear me. Aye. Okay, thank you very much. Three uh, one no. This item is approved. Motion passes on a three-to-one vote. Uh, for those uh, in the public, 
who did call in uh, with their concerns. We had folks who called in in favor. We had folks who called in in opposition to this measure. No one thing that this is a measure uh, passed on the boat in the homeless and poverty community. That being said, obviously, as a civic process works, this goes before the full floor, the, the horseshoe. All 15 members will have an opportunity to vote either against it or for the measure. So uh, you have that opportunity as a move forward. As a move forward, this is a committee of the larger body of the city council. Uh, so um, you have an opportunity to have your voices heard and do your lobbying with individual members as well. That being said, this motion passes on three to one vote. Let's go forward with file item number two. Uh, Luigi, if you could please read it into the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Item number two is a city administrative officer report relative to the state of California homeless housing assistance and prevention grant program round three funding application. Thank you very much. Um, I believe we have Brian uh, Buchner from the CEO's office um, as well as Meredith and Jeff um, from uh, LASA uh, for a brief presentation at this item. Uh, so Brian, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you and good morning, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I'm Brian Buckner, City Homelessness Coordinator in the Office of the CAO. Uh, as the Chair mentioned, also here today are Meredith Berkson and Jeff Proctor from LASA. And, and before I begin, I really want to recognize and thank uh, Margaret Wynn from my staff, who was the lead for this excellent report, as well as Mindy Patonson and Annabelle Gonzalez, Elvia Garcia. Oh, they're coming on camera. It's nice. Uh, Elvia Garcia and, and Claire now. This report reflects a tremendous amount of work in coordination with multiple partners, and so I really want to thank, uh, thank them, and especially Margaret, for their work. Uh, in March of this year, the City Council instructed the CAO to apply for the state's HAP Round 3 funding, which is being administered by the California Interagency Council on Homelessness, or CAL-ICH. Additionally, the CAO and CLA were instructed to report to Council with recommendations on the HAP 3 funding categories, taking into consideration input from LASA, city departments, and priorities from the council and mayor. Uh, as you heard in the previous report from my colleague Mindy, HAP is a block grant program designed to provide jurisdictions with one-time grant funds to support regional coordination and expand or develop local capacity to address homelessness. This is the third such round of funding. And in this round, the city is expected to receive a total allocation of $143,640,000. Uh, the application process for this round, though, is different and more complex than previous uh, application uh, processes as it requires uh, evidence of regional coordination, the creation of a local homelessness action plan, and joint regional outcome goals. And I'll touch on that a little bit more. Uh, the CEO's report before you outlines the recommended funding categories for the application and just want to stress that this is not a programming uh, report like the HAP2 report that you just approved. This is merely to give the CAO authorization to complete the application by the June 30th deadline. Um, the HAP3 grant actually includes two disbursements. Uh, we received the initial disbursement earlier this year. That was $28,728,000. Uh, the, that funding is actually included in the proposal for this report. And based on the state's application timeframe, uh, we expect to receive the remainder of our uh, allocation no later than October of this year. Um, another new feature of the HAP3 funding uh, uh, program is the potential disbursement of bonus funding. Um, there's a total of $180 million in bonus funds that will be available to all HAP3 recipients that meet their funding obligation and required outcome goals. Um, Cal ICH will determine how those uh, bonus funds will be allocated. They haven't provided uh, much clarity into that yet, but the proportionate share, uh, but the, the jurisdictions will receive the proportionate share of the funding as determined by their point in time counts relative to um, their home share of the homeless population. Uh, the, the funding obligation and outcome goals will need to be met by July 1st of 2024, and the bonus funding will be awarded no later than November uh, 2024. Now, to receive the, the bonus funds, and this is important, the city must meet all of the six outcome goals included in the application, um, and the, the goals um, as articulated are included or attached to this report. Cal ICH actually requires that the goals be set at the continuum of care level, also as the continuum of care lead, 
and the goals must correspond uh, to the goals submitted by LASA and the county in their HAP3 application. So LASA, the county, and the city all have to have the same outcome goals, uh, which are at the COC level. Um, again, this is a, an all or nothing um, approach and we have to meet all of the goals or we won't be eligible for the bonus funding. Um, the application process and timeline, uh, again, as I mentioned, the, the grant itself is due on June 30th. Um, and then uh, we have to have as a part of that application, a local homelessness action plan, and then a narrative that outlines our, our strategies for accomplishing our, our goals. Uh, the local action plan is uh, is a document consisting of uh, a number of documents that were attached to this report. Uh, those were not uh, completed by us. Those, uh, including the landscape analysis, uh, analyses, were completed by the state, and they used uh, their HDIS, their statewide uh, database, uh, that is informed by all of the local uh, HMIS systems. So the HMIS system feeds into HDIS. The state does some additional analysis. And then they populated the landscape analysis for our application um, with the, the COC and the city level data, uh, just like they populated all of the other jurisdictions that are, that are applying. Uh, the, the outcome goals uh, that you have, these were developed in collaboration with LASA and with the County Office of uh, Homeless Initiative. Um, and again, Meredith and Jeff are here if you wanted to um, dive into the, the goals a little bit more. Um, but again, just to reiterate, the goals are at the COC level. That, that's not discretionary. We have to submit those, um, and they must be the same as the county and losses goals because all of the applications are being evaluated together. Um, for many other COCs across the state, they're actually submitting just one application. Um, however, the county, city, and LASA all elected to submit their uh, their own independent, uh, or sorry, their own individual application. But all of these three applications will be reviewed and considered together. Uh, generally, the goals are themed around the following: reducing the number of persons experiencing homelessness, reducing the number of persons who become homeless for the first time. Increasing the number of people exiting homelessness into permanent housing, reducing the length of time persons remain homeless, reducing the number of persons who return to homelessness after exiting into permanent housing, and increasing successful placements from street outreach. Um, and then just finally a brief note on regional coordination, as this is um, an intentional uh, part of the HAP3 process. Um, the the CEO's office and, and the city and, and CLA actually uh, worked closely with LASA and the county to accomplish a number of required steps in the application in the application process. We participated in a series of meetings with LASA and the county and created a joint uh, presentation uh, for four separate community input sessions. And the CAO also provided this presentation at a LASA commission in April to help LASA with their required public meeting component of the application. Uh, so I want to uh, make sure that we thank our, our partners, um, both LASA and the, the folks in the county who put in a tremendous amount of work and, and have been extremely collaborative in working together to make sure that our applications are all aligned. Uh, and then finally, just a breakdown of what we are proposing for the funding categories. Uh, there are six in total. Uh, number one, interim housing, operating and capital costs. And for that, we are proposing an allocation of $68,855,991. Uh, category two, skid row housing, uh, $7 million. Category three, permanent supportive housing, uh, $15 million. Category four, outreach, hygiene, prevention, and supportive services, $28,365,209. Uh, youth experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness, and this is a 10% set aside that's required by the state. And for that, we're allocating $14,364,000. And then finally, category six, administrative cost, which is actually capped at 7% by the state. And that uh, category, we're allocating $10,054,800. Uh, Again, for a total of $143,640,000. Um, and with that, happy to answer any questions that the committee might have. Thank you very much, Brian. Before we get to any uh, uh, Q&A uh, from the members, uh, do uh, Meredith or Jeff have anything to, to add? Uh, hello, council members. I'm Jeff Proctor, Director of Funding and Allocations for LASA. Uh, nothing to add right now other than to say thank you for allowing us to be here. 
self answer questions and provide any further context for anything that you all may want to uh, hear from us. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. Um, well, let me say just sort of, kind of overall from, from looking at these goals, it's clear that the, the goals are, um, uh, to put it lightly, extremely conservative. And, and, I, and I realize that these goals have been set extremely low so that we can access potential, you know, bonus funds. But to set aside only 1%, I should say, to set only a 1% reduction goal for the number of people experiencing homelessness seems like a, an extremely, extremely low uh, uh, bar. And given that the city of LA has been doing the, the, the gargantuan lion's share of, of housing our homeless, I'm, I'm concerned that the city uh, could hit the goal, uh, we could hit this goal alone and other cities uh, won't do their fair share. I know this is something that, that, that uh, Mr. Buscaino in, in, in a different way has uh, uh, chimed up about uh, on, on numerous occasions. Um, so let me ask you a question here, or let me ask clarification. Can you explain what will happen with the bonus funding if the city of LA hits our goal but houses more than our fair share? And do we get more of that bonus funding? Or, and it's a capital O-R, or does the whole, you know, COC, you know, uh, the continuum care get funds even if other cities don't do the heavy lifting? Thank you, that's a great, great question, Chair. Uh, yes, thank you for the question, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I do want to emphasize that these goals really should just be considered in the context of the grant application. And to your point, they, they in no way represent the final goals or the, the more ambitious goals of, of the city that, that the council um, and, and mayor have set. Um, with respect to your question, you know, the goal is a COC level goal. And so if the city ends up housing or um, conducts activities that satisfy the COC level goals without the contribution of other cities, it's still the COC and the, the uh, partners in the county uh, and LASA that will all receive their share of the, the bonus funds based on the you know, point in time count. So whether it's the city, uh, the city of LA and other cities um, who uh, help achieve the COC level goals or, or if it's just the city, um, as, as long as we meet the COC level goals, then all of the partners will receive funding. So, uh, so let me let me uh, uh, re re ask the question in a, a different way, or maybe not so much that. But um, so, if we hit our goals and, and go above above and beyond, which we we have been doing, um, and the other cities do not, um, the COC as a whole receives all the money nonetheless. Even if we do the lion's share work and they don't hit their goals, am I, is that correct? Uh, so what, one one clarification. Um, so when you when you're asking if the city the city hits our goals, are you specifically asking like if the city reaches sort of its share of the larger goal, or or you're you're saying does the city reach the overall COC level goals that are articulated in the the, the, the overall the overall COC goals specifically? Our, our our goals are much larger. Our goals are much more ambitious. Our, our, because our challenges are are you know huge. You know in comparison to other cities, but. I'm referring specifically to the COC uh, funding. Right. So, so if the COC level goals are met, again, whether it's just by the city of LA or with the city of LA and other partners, as long as those COC level goals are reached, the partners with respect to our applications, city, county, and LASA would all be eligible to receive their, their share of the bonus funds as determined by the pit count. So, so as long as those COC level goals are, are reached, then all of the partners become eligible. Again, regardless of how we got there, if it was just the city and none of the other cities did, did anything, um, if the COC level goals were reached, then then all of the partners would be eligible. That's where lies the problem, do you think? Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, it certainly seems um, that, that there uh, uh, is the, the chance that or uh, provides a disincentive to some of our, our partner cities um, to, to not contribute and yet still be eligible to receive some of the, the bonus funds. Um, but again, um, you know, just to be to be clear, putting aside the other cities for a moment and just focusing on Los Angeles County, 
um, you know, the city isn't going to be able, um, nor would it ever be able to able to reach those goals without the contributions of our of our partners. And and we obviously work closely with LASA and with the county toward housing and outreach and engagement. And so, um, again, just the, the partners that have been involved in this process and shaping the goals all along, um, you know, we, we fully expect to be working extremely closely with them in the process. Thank you, uh, uh, Brian, um, for the very uh, political answer. Um, <laughs> but uh, thank you nonetheless. No, I appreciate it. Any questions or commentaries? Uh, from the members. Um, I've seen that. Okay, so I do have, you know, Brian, I, I do want to thank you. And I do have full confidence, you know, in the city family to hit these very um, low goals. But, uh, you know, I mean, I think the bottom line, I think collectively, uh, all the members, you know, our vice chair, everyone here, want, we want other cities, you know, to, to do their part as well, too. We want them to step up, you know, and um, because we know that this is a regional issue. A statewide, nationwide issue, and and for us to, to really go at it uh, collectively, we, we have to do our part. Uh, we do have a question or commentary from uh, Vice Chair uh, Nithi. Uh, Nithi, I just had a, a question uh, about the amounts that have been determined for the various funding categories, particularly for um, item for item four in this outreach hygiene prevention supportive services you've proposed i believe an allocation of 35 million dollars under this new no 28 am i reading the wrong thing uh yeah uh, 20 million oh okay anyway I, it, it doesn't really matter i'm looking at page nine on this other but maybe i'm looking at something different um, either way, I was just curious about how you arrived at this amount and what are the programs that are included in this amount um, and, you know, how we can think about how those programs move us towards our broader goals here in the city of L.A. Uh, sure, that's a, a great question. And, and similar to how we've approached um, the HAP2 grant funding um, as well as HAP1, um, the the city's comprehensive homeless strategy, uh, the homelessness roadmap, uh, project home key, uh, and other uh, sort of broader kind of policy initiatives of the city are, are really what's uh, driving or framing for the funding categories um, and the amounts. And a lot of that are the programs and services that have already been set up and are funded either by HAP1 and HAP2 uh, or even going back to HEAP, which was the initial uh, initial one-time state grant funding, um, and just ensuring that all of the programs and services that have already been set up are uh, able to continue operating, and and the the amounts in the categories. I mean, this is this is really just to frame the application. But once we get to the uh, programming portion and come back to the committee with the actual specific recommendations, you know, mm -hmm. we fully expect that some of the amounts m may change. This is really just to sort of guide the, the application and priorities. Okay. It does look like there's a discrepancy in the numbers on pages three and page nine, in terms of the breakdown of this funding, 28 million versus 35 million. Uh, okay. Um, yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so I'm not sure which of those is right, but it would be, you know, good to get a better sense of, um, I, I didn't quite understand from your answer how you, uh, you said it's based on existing programs that we already have and continuing that funding into this next cycle? Um, yes, that's part of it. The, the other um, driving factors are things like the city's comprehensive or the enhanced comprehensive homeless strategy, uh, the homelessness roadmap, um, and, and other kind of major priority initiatives of the of the city. And what's the process through which you're going to be fleshing out the programming under this either 28 or $35 million bucket? Uh, well, given the approach that we're taking to HAP2, I, uh, I expect that we're going to take that same approach where we're going to evaluate the programs and services bring that information back to the committee as a part of our programming recommendations so that uh, this committee and council can ultimately make the, the policy decisions about which which uh, programs and services to, to fund and at what level. Okay. Okay. I think, uh, 
I'm not sure I quite follow the process, but I appreciate it. And I can reach out to your office afterwards for clarifications on exactly what that comprises of and how we can provide some input. Okay, thank you, Ms. Roman. Uh, Mr. Buscana. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just keep in line with Ms. Rahman's concerns, I too share. Um, just as far as like the guiding principles while we're, up, we're applying for these dollars, one, uh, if you uh, refer to the same chart that Ms. Rahman's referring to, uh, item number six, admin costs, $10 million. Um, where we're seeing permanent supportive housing, we're asking for 15 mil. I mean, we can do a lot more of cutting those admin costs with housing those who need the housing, whether it's interim or permanent supportive housing. Again, understanding that this is just an application, but I, I feel that we would um, gain more, I mean, uh, there's more opportunity and more, um, if I think the state would, would give us uh, more dollars towards actually addressing the problem instead of lining the pockets of executives. Um, what are your thoughts? Um, so I, I think that the the admin costs, you know, they're capped at 7%. There's actually quite a lot of administrative work that goes into operating all of these programs and services. And, and I would say that 7% that is actually operating quite leanly. Um, that that the, it funds a number of staff positions in our office, general services department, engineering, um, you know, other other departments who, who are all part of ensuring that the programs are operating, that we're collecting data and reporting, you know, or, or meeting our reporting requirements to the state um, and to our other other partners. So, I, I appreciate I appreciate your comment. I I, I can uh, understand where it's coming from. I just I think that that seven percent is actually quite lean for the number of programs and the amount of dollars that are actually being implemented across the system. That's speed. <laughs> Thank you much, Mr. Uh, Ms. Roman, another question? Uh, yeah, I had an, uh, just a follow-up question on the admin processes. So one of the things that we've talked about frequently during council meetings uh, related to homelessness governance overall is the difference in contracting processes between the city and the county, the changes in how long it takes, for example, to adjust a contract that the city is putting out, um, how much manpower it takes, how long it takes to make even minor adjustments to, for example, an outrage contract that this was a, something that we have been dealing with when we redistricted. We wanted to change the jurisdiction. feels like it should be a fairly straightforward change. It takes an incredibly long time, a huge amount of uh, man hours in the city to do that. Um, even extensions for contracts take a long time within the city, and it's longer than other jurisdictions in the COC for those issues. Um, are those kinds of contracting changes being considered as you're moving forward? I feel like this is one of, uh, you know, one of the bigger challenges that we have in our office and moving in a straightforward way through some of our um, homelessness uh, reduction work. Uh, yes, I agree with you 100%. Um, the housing department, you know, recently had a report that made some recommendations to improve the contracting process um, with with LASA and, and with LASA's, um, uh, with the providers. Uh, there's another report on the agenda today that talks about the, uh, the outreach uh, proposal and the CAO's office is going to be holding those contracts uh, rather than LASA holding those contracts. So I think some of those changes will hopefully uh, make some immediate improvements in the, the timeline and the, um, the ease at which we can execute these contracts. Um, and then there are some longer term solutions that hopefully will result in a more efficient system overall. Anything else, uh, Ms. Roman? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, that being said, uh, what I want to do, um, colleagues, is I want to propose the following amendments on this file item, which is one, instruct the CAO in coordination with LASA to report back um, in 30 days with an analysis of uh, what each city in Los Angeles continuum of care um, proportion to their homeless population needs to do in order to hit our regional uh, HAP uh, three goals. So um, uh, 
Brian, if, if you need me, I'll, I'll refer one more time. Um, but I'll say that um, the CAO, your office in coordination with LASA, to report back in three days with an analysis of which each city in the LA continuum of care proportion to their homeless population needs to do in order to hit our regional HR3 goals. Uh, again, we're in this collectively. Um, we have to work at this collectively. And that means we can't, you know, do what the status quo has been is, is folks have been dumping, you know, human beings, you know, who have real needs um, and uh, into the city of LA. And uh, we've been picking up um, all the pieces. Um, two, we instruct LASA to report back in 30 days with metrics uh, and a reporting system that can be used to track the progress of each city in the LA continuum of care towards hitting our regional HAP three goals. I'll say one more time. We we'll direct LASA to report back uh, to the committee in 30 days with metrics. We'll come back with the presentation, um, uh, Meredith and Jeff, um, um, or whoever else from LASA, um, Jeffrey, I should say, I apologize. Um, and the report back in three days with metrics and a reporting system that can be used to track to track the progress of each city in the LA uh, consumer care towards hitting our regional HAP3 goals. Uh, any questions or commentaries uh, from the members? Uh, seeing none, um, I see that. Uh, okay, I don't know what that was. Um, uh, we have uh, the, the motion that's before us, um, and we have a second by Mr. Boscano. Uh, Luigi, if you could be so kind of, uh, please call the roll. Councilmember DeLeon. Aye. Councilmember Rahman. Yes. Councilmember Buscaino. Yes. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez is absent. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Four ayes, and this item is approved as amended. Thank you much, uh, Luigi. Uh, to Brian, thank you very much uh, for coming uh, once again. We look forward to it uh, sometimes. And Jeffrey and Meredith, thank you very much. Um, motion passes on a 4 0 vote. But we have just one last uh, item before us, colleagues. Um, and that item, I believe, uh, we have the uh, uh, Mr. John Wickham uh, from the CEO's office to do a brief uh, presentation. Uh, John, the, uh, the virtual microphone. Uh, good morning, John Wickham with the Office of the Chief Legislative Analyst. Um, uh, before you, item number three is, concerns a, an instruction from City Council for the CLA to prepare a request for bids to seek qualified um, service providers to offer general outreach services in the city. Um, following, um, we had extensive assistance from the CAO have conversations with LASA and assistance from LASA in preparing, evaluating um, the scope of services needed for such services, um, for such a program. And we also looked at national models and best practices for outreach and other research on the subject matter in order to come together with the scope of work that is presented to you in our report today. Uh, it's a, a substantial, um, full, description of a scope of work that uh, bidders will be asked to respond to and at, at the end of the process um, it uh, it is intended to create a list of qualified bidders and then each council uh, district would have a would make a selection of bidder of uh, service provider to offer general outreach services in the district the um, just a few things uh, from for your awareness is that the city does not currently manage, operate, administer outreach programs. And so this is a new thing for us to be doing. And the um, um, what we're recommending is that a department actually be designated to um, administer this program, operate this program. That would be the CAO, the city administrative officer, as they've been developing their homeless program, including um, recently staffed to manage outreach uh, services. The, in the process of preparing this, 
we had some conversations with the city attorney and with the Bureau of Contract Administration, and it was determined that the city's service worker retention ordinance applies in this case. So in, if there is any situation where current LASA staff would um, lose their, their job as a result of this transfer of outreach services from LASA to service providers, service providers would um, be obligated to make a job offer to those employees. Uh, further, there is um, at LASA employee outreach workers um, at LASA are members of, uh, of a union and there is a set wage um, according to that agreement. The, we don't know who will be responding. We don't know what the employment situation will be at those service providers. And so um, we could be seeing different uh, salary ranges that would occur there. At a minimum, as a contractor with the city, they would be obligated to comply with the city's living wage ordinance. Uh, and so that would be in place. The other point I wanted, we wanted to draw your attention to our data and metrics. It will be required that any service provider um, uh, be input data to the HMIS system, um, the Homeless Management Information System managed by LASA. That is the da regional data system that supports our federal and state uh, requirements. And so it is essential that this data that would be collected in this program be um, submitted to that system so that we um, are continue our eligibility for those funding sources and meet those regulatory compliant um, uh, requirements. And as you just heard, there are regional um, goals and objectives as a result of the HAP3 program. And so ensuring that service providers here are inputting data into HMIS is important. The other thing to keep in mind is there will be some work required to manage data and metrics among 15 or who knows how many service providers will actually receive contracts at the end of the day. And so it, it you know, right now we have one service provider, so it's, it's easier to manage the data, metrics, benchmarks, et cetera, and monitoring um, that will become more complicated in the future. So that is my very brief uh, presentation. Um, happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, John, uh, for, for the presentation. And I know this is something that, that many council members um, have been uh, eager to hear. And today, um, I'm going to recommend that, that we prove this. But, but first, um, I want to, to touch on, on a few concerns I have, issues that uh, may arise um, through this process. First, I think, and probably most importantly, um, is protecting the workers who are dedicated to addressing the humanitarian crisis, whether it be on the streets, sidewalks, out of ways, you know, in folks' cars, underpasses, and so forth, uh, every place imaginable. So I, I believe that we need to make sure that the, that the workers uh, on the homeless engagement teams and other city-funded teams are able to transition to any new contractor if they would like to uh, at their current uh, uh, pay rate. Uh, I'm glad that we have a retention process but no one should be asked to do the same work uh, for less pay, uh, especially uh, as inflation rises uh, across the board. Second is that um, I want to emphasize that the reporting metrics uh, you may reference to, uh, uh, frequency and accuracy of, of this data is, we know, extremely, extremely important. Uh, the bottom line is the, the, uh, the, the RFB notes that an annex will be created as a, uh, created to a standardization and the reporting metrics and presentation across, you know, uh, providers. But we need to be able to track whether or not uh, what we're doing is working so we can make course corrections if, if need be, if, if the strategy or process isn't providing the end results, the desired results that, that we all want, you know, collectively. Uh, lastly, I think that we should view this item as a as a, a companion to what we just voted for uh, final item number six which instructed the CAO to look into the possibility of bringing outreach uh, uh, in house to the city 
I, I, I don't think in the end that we should move forward without ensuring workers are protected and we need to understand all the options that are before us. So um, I know this is the first in, in many ways for us uh, given the situation, but my question to you, John, is or perhaps to you or to the CEO's office or collectively, will you come back to this committee uh, once you've received all the acceptable uh, bids if we get bits, you know, uh, it's a question we even get bits, you know, the big one, which I understand, you know, uh, and brief us on what the next steps are. Yeah. I, I, the CAO is um, available. I believe that, and we should bring back the results of the RFB to you so you understand the that, that outcome. That's important for you to understand the direction that this is going, what kind of responses were received, um, et cetera, and, and evaluate the steps of moving forward. Part of um, what we have in, in the instructions as well is for the CAO to report with the transition plan. And so I think that would be a part of reporting on it, on the pro, you know, if you move forward in this, how would you move forward? There would be some kind of a transition plan. Um, finally, with regard to data metrics, I, I um, didn't mention, it's in our report, that LASA has been working with the California Policy Lab to develop exactly the type of metrics that you you are talking about just now. And I think there is great opportunity and potential in the work that's being done to develop metrics that will actually lead to um, um, effective um, management decision making and course correcting as we move forward in the future. So I think that's a very hopeful uh, project and I know that there will that will come forward to the council for review and evaluation in the, in the relatively near future. Very good, John. I, I, I do uh, believe that we need to move forward with this today, but we must do so with, with caution and I think an understanding that it's not an act of removing, you know, loss of workers, uh, outreach works to be very specific, but simply the city learning, you know, all of our options and putting it on the, the, the table. Um, Actually, my, I, I should have addressed that too. Um, LASA has uh, outreach contract with the county as well. So to the extent that LASA is able to um, retain employees and not, not release anybody, that's, that's, the primary, I mean, that's probably the best outcome. Um, so we don't know what what it will look like at the end of the day. And But your point is very well taken. Okay, and the only point is, uh, thank you, thank you, John. My only amendment is requested that all references to 41.18 uh, uh, or any other specific code language be changed to read as all current Los Angeles municipal codes, you know, um, that being said, uh, we have colleagues or, or, or uh, questions, commentaries. Mr. Uh, um, uh, Madam, uh, Ms. Robin, I should say, Ms. Robin, the, the floor is yours. Um, I, you know, I, I wanted to have, ask a couple of questions about the language in the RFB, um, if that's okay. One question is about um, the scope of work for outreach workers that you're asking for. Does the interim housing assistance uh, being requested by outreach workers include the development of a service plan, you know, something based on a needs assessment and, you know, of, of individuals and connections to services. Interim housing assistance is a, could be interpreted in a number of ways, so I just wanted to clarify what, what that means in terms of providing services to individuals that you're outreaching to. Yeah, yeah. I guess if there's no clarity on it, I think I would recommend that we include specific language in the RFB around creating a service plan for... Um, so the service plan would be created um, for somebody who is still unsheltered mm -hmm. before they are placed into... That is the... Okay. I it, it, a service plan, it, you know, basically like a service plan that's uh, based on a needs assessment and then figuring out what connections to services they need in terms of housing stability. If okay. that language is not in there currently, it just says interim housing assistance, which is a very broad, um, you know, I, I know there's specificity, for example, there's specificity in the contract already around ensuring that outreach workers are providing um, 
assistance in getting people housing ready. So that would mean things like getting IDs and that, that, so that level of specificity is in the contract or in the RFB already. And I think also just making sure that we are being specific about providing a needs assessment based service plan is important to include in the language. Cause again, that's what we're asking for from our service providers when we work with our outreach workers, when we work with them here so that we can then as a council office and as a city overall, when we do this strategize around how we make sure that we are supporting them with meeting the services that those individuals need. And if there's a gap, then we can fund it in other ways, you know, yeah. but we won't know that because they're being asked to do that. Uh, council member, thank you very much for this clarification. As, as I said, this is the first time we're, we're going down this path. Yeah. And um, in the review that we did, we saw that our current outreach contract is not as fulsome as it could be. And we saw that some other service contracts are ex extremely um, you know, detailed. And so having this kind of a change in, in a referral and reference is incredibly necessary to ensure that the city is receiving the services that it wants. And so we will make sure that this is added to the scope. Oh, so should, do I need to make a formal motion? Should I be making a formal motion to include this as an amendment to our RFP? Because I really, I do think it's really important to include this specific. Second it. Second it. Okay, great, okay. thank you. That's helpful, yeah. thank you. Yes, okay. Um, and then I just wanted to ask about the wage issue um, and Council Member DeLeon, I think what you brought up around the wages for existing outreach workers is really important. Um, I would go maybe one step further here and potentially amend this also to say that any provider maintain losses contract wage scale, um, just so that we're not actually contracting out and you know, new workers are getting paid really low rates in order to, to do this work. I feel like we want to be making sure city dollars are being used for for wages that really make sense and, and that came up from worker requests for for what they felt was a, an important wage to have for outreach workers. So, so that would be for any outreach worker um, providing the service not or only for those that would transition from loss to a service provider so it doesn't matter what that status is does that make sense yes yeah. Exactly. yeah so maybe just expanding councilmember de leon's amendment to to just say that for all all workers be meeting that scale that okay. better contract so that we're basically what i don't want this contract to do would be to take jobs from government workers right now move them into the private sector at cut rates like that's a, that's what would be happening if we were allowing that and i just i don't that doesn't sit right with me i know that doesn't sit right with councilmember de leon that's what he was okay. just bringing so so to say that another way the rfb would include a salary floor that's consistent or a salary range that's consistent with the current salary range offered by lasa for outreach services Yes, that's what I would be. Okay, that's the point. Okay. Yes. And should I be making a formal amendment around that? Yes, that should be. I'd like to, yes, I'd like to make amend the motion to include that language, please. But maybe I don't have a second. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. I was having trouble. Uh, uh -huh with uh um, getting to my unmute uh brand. yes you did have a second um, so could we could you please um read that once again because i know you have two uh amendments i know the one with regards to the uh service plan the other one with regards to the pay scale uh, of folks uh uh um uh, outreach workers um, going to another nonprofit, uh, possibly in terms of the bids. So, could you please read them so we, Louise, you can have them for the record? As um, I, you know, I had them as questions, but I can like amend the amend the. No more as questions, okay? Well, I, well, I can, I can, I can talk it out. Um, I would like to amend the motion to include uh, that the scope of work under interim housing assistance includes a development of service plans for individuals 
um, experiencing homelessness. Okay. okay, that was one for the service based on based on a needs needs assessment um, okay. for services. Okay, and we have a second one. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm feel, oh, sorry, you you wanted, the, and the second one was John. I think you had language for that. Oh, I would, I would, uh, we would set the salary range consistent with loss of pay scale for outreach workers. Minimum baseline, yeah. As a floor, yeah, that's what I think you said. Yeah. All right, you got that, Luigi? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments from the members? Yeah, I uh, just, I wanted to ask um, just a broader question around what you were talking about earlier, um, Councilmember DeLeon, with the process of this. So I see that, you know, there's two different, there's a budget motion, budget recommendation here about bringing outreach programs in-house. There's this RFB, which talks about taking outreach away from LASA and giving it to individualized service providers. And is the option of still continuing with LASA as a partner still on the table for us? Like, what is the process? It seems like these are three different options that are ahead of us as a city. And I'm not certain, given that there's two different things even on this agenda that are being proposed, how are we evaluating those options and how are we moving forward on them? Yes, you were answering the question earlier, John. I don't I think that was me. That hurt to me. I, I got well, a little, you were talking about that. So, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm just puzzled looking at the two different paths offered here, plus potentially a third one, which includes continuing our current engagement with LASA. And those are all really different ways of moving forward with outreach in the city that are being discussed right now. I don't know what is on the I, I don't know how we make evaluate those three different options. Are we going to be looking at each of them, understanding their benefits, and making a decision, or are all of these processes moving forward simultaneously and somehow we're going to do all three? Uh, well, we certainly have two new processes moving forward at the moment. I think the primary path currently, or the most advanced, the most advanced new path is this RFB. This is we've we've prepared the scope of work. This will result in going out for, um, you know, response to potential bidders. The next pat new path moving forward is the, the motion that you just adopted to evaluate the option of bringing it in-house. I think those two will meet at some point in the future once you see the results of the bid process. And, and you will gauge what that list will look like. Will it be a really extensive list of service providers or will it be a very small list of service providers and you um, might have trouble finding coverage for the, for the full city? Because that is one of the, one of the issues. You would want and to make sure that- And we've already had one situation where we put out an RFP for outreach that, for which we received zero bids, right? Exactly. And, um, and, you know, I think, you know, for your, for your district in particular, where you have a portion in the valley and a portion um, on, you know, the south side of the Santa Monica Mountains in the basin, you may need different service providers or different approaches. And so the question, will you, will you have a list of bidders that um, satisfy that? You know, there are other districts that may have those kinds of issues. And so I think once you see the results of the bid process, you will be able to better evaluate whether that path um, is appropriate uh, or not. The second new path is um, the question of bringing it in-house. And since that is a new question, that research hasn't advanced, and so it's not clear how, what the implications of that are. And so the, the, re the report from the CAO will be helpful in that. The, the third option would be to find a, um, to move forward with the current approach which would be to retain LASA, but I would, I would advise you to use the scope of work that you have in front of you now. As I said, the scope of work with LASA currently is not as um, rich as it could be to ensure that we receive the services we expect. And, and I think that's a function of the history of how the program developed for outreach services. And it's only now that we have come to this point where we've seen that a much 
a more complete scope of uh, work for the service is necessary and appropriate to put in place. And so the third option that comes together at the very end of the day is that specific point of saying, okay, we can retain LASA to do this, but we need this scope of work done. Got it. And the way that we would be making a decision between these is to receive these are the, the bidders receive the research from this other budget motion and then evaluate those options at a future date altogether. Yes. Yes. So because this is all entirely the council's policy decision. And so we want to make sure that you have all of the information and data available for you to make that, uh, that choice. Yes. That's precisely, we need to see all three discussed as one so we have all the options that are before us so ultimately we'll make that uh, informed decision. It, it's possible at the end of the day that we can just maintain the status quo. You know, at the end of the day, no one, you know, moves forward, you know, with the bid, you know, we'll soon find out, you know, but uh, we have to see all the options before us so we can make ultimately that. Uh, one final informed decision. Uh, Mr. Sorry, could I, just, I just wanted to ask one, one final question, which is, right. you have a sense of how many uh, unionized workers there are at LASA who would be impacted with the change if we move forward with, um, you know, moving it to private providers? I don't at the moment. I believe we have a total of 45 um, hats homeless engagement teams um, mm -hmm. that the city is funding. I think 30 of those are on the Care Care Plus and 15, and these are rough, 15 are on the roadmap. Okay. Um, each, team, each team is two, two people. So I think we're talking about 90 staff total. Okay. But again, if LASA has other openings within the organization, it may be that they will be able to adjust their staffing in a way that nobody will be um, displaced. So okay. it's not something that we'll actually know the outcome until the very end, uh, toward the end of this process. Okay, great. And thank you for your um, responses, John. And I do want to say I have some concerns around the implications of privatizing workers that are covered by a collective bargaining agreement into nonprofits where they don't have those anymore. And it has taken a while for those workers to get to the wage levels that they're at right now. Um, and I think outreach workers deserve to be paid, not just the living wage floor, but really something that responds to the, the difficulties that, you know, they face in their work and how much we value and need this work here in LA. So I'll be looking forward to continuing these discussions. Thank you. Yeah, I, I have a, I have a, 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 a canny sense that if we were to go in that direction, that, that 721 will, will do a fine job in terms of their organizing prowess. Uh, that being said, Mr. Blumenfield. Thank you, and, and I certainly agree with the sentiment about wanting to make sure we pay our outreach workers and, and not wanting to privatize these jobs. Um, I'm a little concerned, though, about implications. I mean, I've been working with SHARE and, and a lot of other groups in my district and that may have a different arrangement in terms of how they how they compensate their workers, the tying and all the rest, and, they, and they've been doing a good job. And I don't want to put them uh, out of business because they have been doing, uh, we have been getting a lot of people housed through SHARE and through other ones. Um, so I'm, I'm just a little concerned and, and the, the, the Wages at lots of, uh, you know, I want the workers to be paid the the wage it is. But as we know, it was it was set in a weird way. It wasn't through the collective bargaining process. It was the the executive director made a unilateral decision, um, and that was all part of the her exit letter she talked about. And you know, that concerns me to have, in essence, now all of the salaries set by. By you know, uh, by Lassa and by the executive director there, whoever it may be, at a different time. Not because I don't want to see the highest salaries, I do, but in terms of the flexibility that that comes from a collective bargaining process and that can come from uh, that, that some of these agencies have been able to use. 
how do you do that though without allowing we don't want folks to undercut our lots of workers and just offer the same services at lower wages that's not right either and we want to we want you know it's always better to do things in-house than to to, to bring it out of house but i just i raise these as concerns because i'm not sure how this is how this is going to play out and i, I haven't really had the chance to evaluate it and i'd love i mean your thoughts on there what what are some of the complications here is this something that we should be looking at you know once we get the the contracts back to make sure that there's equity to make sure that um that there's flexibility frankly because some of the ways that you know it's it's not simply about the the salary it's a it's about a number of factors that the workers care about and frankly it's about you know, I, I wish that when Lassa went and did that, that they they did it. They also included an hours changed and allowed for the collective bargaining process to allow to have you know weekend more weekend uh, outreach. And that's one of the reasons why we keep calling for other folks is because we're rigid on the Lassa side, frankly, because they didn't go through that bargaining process. So I don't know. I'm a little torn on it, uh, Mr. Wickham. I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on on that in terms of you know how do we ensure the protection of our workers and, and not being undercut, but allow for uh, for the flexibility that these agencies can provide. Uh, you, this is all this is all part of the discussion today. I haven't gotten too deep into this evaluation. So um, the the one thing that concerns me is that when we go for a bid, we should be clear on our expectations of what a service provider should be doing. And so I would want to make sure that whatever our, rec our requirement is with regard to salaries, that that be present in the bid. Um, it would not be fair to change those expectations after the bidding process is complete. I, I don't know how we balance all, because we're dealing with, the, we're dealing with, um, Basically, the private sector. Not, you know, there are a lot of nonprofit organizations, but it is the private sector, and they have their processes for setting salaries, and they have their um, staffing levels and their staffing um, organizational um, structure. Part of this bid process is for them to report back to us on what their their staffing structure would look like, not just for the outreach side, but also management and administration of a grant. Um, and so there are lots of different types of dynamics going on in a private organization with regard to salaries. Now they would be they would be re putting in a response to this bid. This bid would have some guidelines or structure on what that should be. But I you know I can't really evaluate on the fly this question of what I I just know what the loss of salary is. I know what that salary range is. I, I can't, I don't have any additional analysis beyond that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or commentaries from the members? Seeing that, I think this is pretty thorough. Uh, John, uh, thank you very much. The, the motion that's before us with the three uh, amendments. You have those amendments? That's correct, Mr. Chair. As amended, okay. Uh, we have uh, a second by Mr. Blumenfield. I uh, see no other questions or commentaries. Uh, Luigi, please call the roll. Councilmember De Leon. Aye. Councilmember Raman. Yes. Councilmember Buscaino. Aye. Councilmember Rodriguez. Councilmember Rodriguez is absent. Councilmember Blumenfield. Blumenfield, aye. Four eyes, and this item is approved as amended. Okay, thank you very much. I have passed on the 4 0 vote. Today's uh, meeting has quite a few very important report back to this committee so we can ultimately make a decision as we move forward. I'm uh, looking forward to those report backs uh, coming back, and um, I think they're going to be thorough. Hopefully, they'll be thorough, and we have a, a really good, uh, healthy conversation as we move some very important decision making uh, moving forward on the metrics and and whatever type of changes we want to make with regards to LASA and outreach and so forth. So with that, uh, Luigi, I believe that the depth is clear. If you can please confirm. The depth is clear. 
desk is clear, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, uh, as everyone else understands, please have a wonderful day. Thank you very much. This meeting is adjourned. Bye-bye.